chapter. So, hey, what I want you to do this morning is take your Bibles, open up to the book of Galatians is where we're going to be this morning. We're going to be in the book of Galatians. I want you to go to chapter 4 when you get there. I want to give you just a little bit of background on the book of Galatians, this letter that Paul wrote. Because see, Paul wrote, this is not a singular church. This is actually a letter written to a group of churches in the province of Galatia, which is in kind of modern day Turkey, to give you just a geographical reference point. And Paul writes this letter to the churches that are in Galatia to counter a very common false teaching that was taking place. See, Paul had planted these churches, and then after he has left and gone on in his ministry, some Jewish missionaries came back behind him. And what they began teaching is that they began teaching that Gentile believers needed to follow the Mosaic law in order to be saved. Not only did they need to follow the letter of the Mosaic law, but they even needed to submit to the rite of circumcision if they truly wanted to be saved. And so this legalistic addition to the gospel began spreading throughout all of these Gentile churches and it was wreaking havoc in the early church. So much so that it it risked stealing the very life and joy of the early church. And so Paul pins this letter of Galatians to counteract this legalistic teaching that was going on to counteract this view of the Judaizers. And and I thought about that because I was thinking about non-soccer fans. Because we all know some of those people in our lives, right? They're people that not only are unhappy themselves, but they want you to be unhappy as well. That's what was going on. Because it wasn't just that these Jews felt unfreed and still felt tethered to the Mosaic law, it was that they wanted everybody else to be tethered to it as well. It wasn't just that these Jews were adding additional conditions to salvation for themselves, they wanted to add additional conditions of salvation for everybody else in life. And, and I thought about that because look, we, we still have that going on, right? Not just the non-soccer fans amongst us. But we have that going on in church, don't we? We have it going on on social media. We have it going on in our congregations. People who want to tell us what their version of spirituality looks like and that their version of spirituality, it's the real version. And man, they've got scriptures to back it up. They've got reasons why. My best example of this right now that's going on is everyone who is debating whether or not to have church on Christmas morning, right? And so if you're wondering, we we are going to have church on Christmas morning. I'm going to tell you a little bit more at the end of what that's going to look like because it's going to look a little different. But man, like the pastor world has erupted over people like, are you doing church on Christmas? Are you not? If you don't, you obviously don't love Jesus. And if you do, you don't love Jesus because you're making all your people. It's, It's ridiculous. But it really reminds me of what was happening in Galatia. Because see, the the ancient equivalent was was not only this church, but it goes all the way back, I think, to Luke 15, to the story of the two sons, that the biblical example of what these Judaizers were doing is the biblical example of the older son. It wasn't just that he stayed home, right? It wasn't just that he stayed with the father and did the things of the father. It was that he was mad that the little brother didn't. And in our our modern world, I thought, you know what, beyond, you know, obviously the non-soccer fans that I've taken a lot of time to make fun of this morning, I also thought about the Ebenezer Scrooge complex, right? I think maybe Dickens gave us the best modern example of this in Scrooge. Dr. Seuss mirrored it with the Grinch, right? A heart and a soul that is just absolutely grouchy and greedy and selfish and bitter and unhappy, And yet what we get in the modern equivalent is that in the story of Christmas, in this season, that even the most greedy, grouchy, unhappy soul can be turned into a heart of joy. It it really is a trope that's at the heart of almost every Christmas movie we have, right? Whether it's George Bailey and It's a Wonderful Life, whether it's Susan Walker and Miracle on 34th Street, Walter Hobbs and Elf, Every single Hallmark movie that's been made, like all 100 million of them, you know, it's at this heart that the idea is that at Christmas time, even the coldest, hardest, most bitter heart can be changed. And that's really where I want to sit today. Because what I want to hopefully do is help remind every single one of us, no matter how we have walked in today, maybe Christmas is your favorite time of year. Maybe if you're just honest, Christmas is a nightmare for you. 
It's a, a time of grief. It's a time of loss. Maybe for some of you this year, this Christmas, just feels chaotic in the midst of everything that's going on. And so my hope this morning is to help remind us of the joy that's in the Christmas story. And the fact that every part of the incarnation was built to bring us good news of great joy. So I want you to look at Galatians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 3 through 7 this morning. This is what scripture says. Paul writes and says, In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we are so thankful for this time together. Lord, whether we are here physically, whether it is someone who is joining us online, God, I am just thankful that you have gathered together those that you desire to speak to today. And Lord, my prayer is that you would do just that, that you would speak into their hearts. God, give us truth, give us joy, give us the good news that is meant to fill our lives and meet us in this season and in every day. And Lord, my prayer is that in this moment, that you would be glorified above all things. Father, that every part of you would increase and every part of me would decrease. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray today. Amen. I want you to look at verse 4 because, look, the first thing that I want you to see is this, is that when Jesus came, it's good news. Do you notice how Paul starts verse 4? He says, but when the fullness of time had come. That word for fullness was really a word that meant a sum total. It, mean, it meant to bring something to completion. And it's really used in this passive sense that, that meant that something has been completed or filled by someone or something else. Paul uses it in Romans 13 when he says that love is the fulfillment of the law, that literally the law has been completed by love. He uses it in 1 Corinthians 10 when he says that for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, that all of creation has been filled by God. He uses it in Colossians chapter 1 when he says that for in him, talking about Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, that literally Jesus shows us the complete picture of God. He uses it in Ephesians chapter 1 when he talks about us, the church, and says that we are Jesus' body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In other words, we are meant to be the complete picture of Jesus. It is a word that spoke of completeness, and the implication is that everything that God intended, everything that God intended from the moment that time was created, from the moment in Genesis 1 when he set the sun right over the day and the moon over the night, that everything from that point on was leading up to this point. All of it was to be fulfilled by Jesus. That the incarnation is literally the very point of history. It's not the hinge of history. It is the point of history. Pastor H.B. Charles from Florida puts it this way, and I love how he says it. He says, the incarnation was no last minute solution for sin. It was not a hastily thrown together rescue mission. It was not too early or too late. It was right on time. Now look, can't you imagine that that was hard for the Jews to believe? At the point that Jesus was born, they have gone 400 years with no prophetic voice in Israel. It's been 400 years since God has spoken to his people and they were desperate for change. They were desperate for hope. They were living under the oppression of the Roman Empire, and from their perspective, I have to imagine that it, it had to seem as if God just didn't care anymore, as if God just wasn't listening anymore to them, and yet that was not their reality. The reality is that God really was working out his plan in his time. They just couldn't see it yet. And listen, for some of us, it, isn't that the truth too? 
Some of us are frustrated because it seems like God isn't talking and we are waiting on a word from the Lord. Listen to me, don't give up. Because his word is coming. It's coming in his time and in his way, in the fullness of his time. Some of us are desperate for deliverance, whether it's from sin our addiction, our anxiety, our grief. We are desperately crying out saying, God, I need you. But look, he hasn't forgotten us. Deliverance is coming. It's coming in his time and it's coming in his way. Some of us are hungry for hope. But don't give up because hope is coming in his time and in his way. The first piece of the incarnations that good that is good news is that God's timing is perfect how you feel right now how your life is right now how your marriage is right now parents listen to me where your children are right now is not the end of the story can I say that one more time where you are right now is not the end of the story God is not done writing it yet And so don't you give up because in his time and in his way, he will bring out his will in the fullness of time in every single one of us. When Jesus came is good news. But the second thing I want you to see is that who sent Jesus is good news. Look at how Paul continues in verse 4. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. And that word for sin is, is two words that Paul kind of smashes together, and it literally meant to send someone out from yourself. Do you, do you understand what Paul is saying? What he's saying is that Jesus didn't come out of his own volition. He didn't send himself. He didn't come apart or independent of his Father in heaven. He was sent out from God himself, which means that in Jesus' coming, we see the heart of God. We see the fact that when a Savior was needed, God just didn't send us what was required. God sent the very best that he had to give. He sent us his Son. And look, if that doesn't show us the heart of love that God has for us, I don't know what will. The Apostle John picks that up and he writes this in 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He says that in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. He goes on in verse 14 and he says this, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Jesus didn't come because God just wanted to judge the world. Jesus didn't come because God was looking to just condemn the world. Jesus didn't come just to teach us a list of truths. He didn't come to give us a a system of philosophy. Jesus didn't come to show us everything that we have done wrong or to reveal somehow all the brokenness in our hearts. Do those things happen as we look to him? Yes, but listen to me. First and foremost, Jesus came out of love. And he came to show us the love of the Father. When Jesus came is good news, but I hope you understand that who sent Jesus is such good news because what it means is that God loves us enough that he sent his son. Thirdly, how Jesus came is good news. Paul goes on, he says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law. That word for born, Paul only uses two times in all of his writings, and this is it. You may say, Joe, why is that important? Well, it's important because of the two things that Paul connects together with that word. The fact that he uses it to connect the idea of flesh and the idea of law holds huge implications for us. First, when Paul says that he was born under the law, here's what he means. He means under the curse of the law. You see, when God called Israel out of Egypt and he, had, he met with them at Sinai and established Israel as his people, he made a covenant with them. Now, we tend to think of a covenant just as a promise, but that is not what a covenant was in the Old Testament. 
See, in that day and time, a covenant was a very literal, formal contract entered in between a superior party and an inferior party, where the inferior party pledged their loyalty to the superior power, and the superior power made a list of promises, both blessings and curses, that if the inferior person would agree to hold up their end of the deal, that they would do. And so at Sinai, God gives the people a list of blessings that will happen if they follow his law and follow his word, but he also gives them a list of curses that will happen if they disobey him and get away from his word. And Moses, Moses reminds them of this as in his very last address to the people in Deuteronomy 27, he says to them, Cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of the law by carrying them out. And so when Paul writes and says that Jesus was born under the law, he's trying to make sure that they understand that he was born under the same system and the same curse that they had, that they had known. And at this point, it had become a curse. Because the, the law that they had accepted was a code that they could not live by. In fact, the whole story of Israel from the moment of Sinai all the way to when Jesus comes is that they wanted to do the easy thing. They wanted to follow God the easy way. They wanted a list of what to do and what not to do so that God would bless them and they could live their lives with just enough of Yahweh that they could be blessed and that things would go well with them, right? Right? But not enough of Yahweh that, that it would inconvenience them. Not enough of Yahweh that, that they would do everything that God asked. Not enough of Yahweh that they would get uncomfortable. And man, like, church, listen to me. Whether you're here or watching this online, is, does that not describe us? We want just enough of Jesus that life will go well for us, right? Just enough of Jesus that God will do what we want and when we want. Just enough of Jesus that we can be comfortable. But man, when God says, follow me wherever I go, do whatever I've asked you to do. And it pushes us and it breaks us and it chips away at us and it brings up things in our own hearts that we're not sure we, we want or that we like. All of a sudden, we start struggling. But listen, what the curse of the law reminds us is that God says, look, you want to be my people. Here's what it's going to take. And you're never going to be able to do it. Not on your own. And so the story of Israel is a story of a people who exhibit this and illustrate this over and over again. And yet somehow, by the time of the New Testament, they thought they were doing it pretty well. In fact, they thought they were doing it well enough that they had an entire system, 690 laws, that they felt like kept them in the boundaries, right? Enough that James writes to Jewish believers around the world and says, look, you need to remember something, that if you violate one law, you're guilty of violating the whole law. That the curse of the law doesn't just apply to those who break 10 of them or 20 of them or 30 of them. It applies to anyone who breaks a single one of them. And if you break a single bit of the law, then you are condemned by the law because the law that God gave called for perfection. And none of us is perfect. None of us is able to obey every part of it. And to think we can, to think we do, is just ego. And some of us right now are sitting in this room, and I say this with as much love as I can, but you really think you're doing pretty well obeying the law. And I, I want to look at you this morning and tell you you're not. That you're just as much of a sinner today as you were when you got saved. That you need Jesus just as much today as you did 20 years ago or 30 years ago or 40 years ago or 60 years ago. There is not a single one of us that is any better at following the law today as we have ever been. Because it is outside of our ability to do. But listen, that as much of a curse as that is, the good news is this. The good news is because God didn't intend to leave us that way. When Paul says that Jesus was born underneath the law, he's saying that because what he wants us to understand is that Jesus is the only way to free us from the law. He writes this in the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. He says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order for what? That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. 
He goes on in Romans chapter 10 verse 4 and he says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I, I really love how the New Living Translation renders this. It says, For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. Earlier in the book of Galatians, Paul puts it this way, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Here's what Paul wants us to understand when he says that Jesus was born under the curse, was that only one who was born under the law could free us from the law. I don't have to be perfect anymore. Neither do you. It doesn't matter what the scorecard looks like for me anymore, and neither does it matter for you. It doesn't matter if I have a good day or a good week or a good month, and it doesn't matter for you. All that matters is that God looks at me and he sees the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. It took one born under the law to free us from the law. But Paul also makes sure that we understand that Jesus was not only born under the law, but what? Born of woman. And I think it's important because God spoke in a language we could understand. He he came into our humanity. He declared his commitment to us by becoming one of us. He too was born. He too grew and lived and ate and drank and slept and cried and laughed. He too tasted death and all of that matters because just in the same way that only one who was under the law could free us from the law. So too could only one who had walked in the flesh truly free us from the desires of the flesh. When I'm tempted, what I have to remember is that there was one who walked and faced temptation and he didn't give in. And so there is strength and hope for me. I don't have to fall every single time, right? It takes one who had experienced the highs and lows of earthly life that can enter into our highs, into our lows and sympathize with us. Jesus cried, he mourned, he experienced loss. He saw things go well, he saw things absolutely, utterly fail, right? He understands every place that we walk, everywhere that we go. I love how one commentator said this. He said, Jesus didn't just come to be with us, he came to be us. And because of that, because he was under the same limits and the same requirements and the same curse of flesh and law, he was able to live the life that we could not live. And he was able to pay the price that we could not pay. And he was able to win the victory that we could not win. Which really brings me to the last bit of good news in this story, which is this. Is that why Jesus came is good news. Look at verse 5. Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? To redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Look, in that day and age, a person would redeem a slave for only one of two reasons. Either A, to free them, or B, so that they could bring them into their house and make them their own servant to enslave them themselves. It would have been unthinkable in Jesus' day and time for someone to go and make payment for a slave, bring them back to their house, and then make them an heir of the estate. And yet, that is what Paul says Jesus did for us. That he redeemed us, right? That we might have adoption as sons. But I want you to also see that word receive. Because I love every part of what this word implies. It's a word that literally meant to get what is due or deserved. And you know why I love it? Because we, we don't deserve anything, right? We're not do anything based on ourselves. In fact, Romans 6, 23, Paul writes to us and says that for the wages of sin is death, that literally what we are due for our sin is separation from God. But what Paul says is that Jesus has changed what we deserve. Do you get that? That no longer am I do what my sin calls for. No longer do I deserve the payment for sin. What I deserve now from this moment on is everything that Jesus is due himself. We are not saved because we worked for it. We're not forgiven because we deserve it. We are not redeemed because we have earned it. 
But all of the forgiveness and all of the mercy and all of the grace and all of the redemption that we receive is due to us only because of what Jesus has done for us. He's changed what we deserve. Again, I go back to Pastor H.B. Charles, and I love how he puts this in four different quotes. He says this. He says, he, talking about Jesus, stood before God with all our sin upon him that we, through faith, might stand before God with none of our sin on us. He who was righteous, he says, was judged as unrighteous that we who are unrighteous can be judged before God as righteous. That he, talking about Jesus, was treated as if he had committed all of our sins so that God would treat us as if we had practiced all of his righteousness. He paid a debt that he did not owe for those who owed a debt that we could not pay. Was it fair? No. Church, listen to me. It was grace. It was grace. It was unmerited and unearned and undeserved favor done out of the love of God and, and in our darkest moments of doubt, of despair, of anxiety, of pain, of grief, even in maybe our ugliest moments of selfishness and pride and greediness and bitterness, Here's what I hope you understand, is it doesn't, doesn't so much matter where you are as it matters what's been done for you. Because Jesus has changed what you deserve. He has paid the price for you so that you could receive adoption as sons and as daughters of him. That's the good news of the incarnation of Jesus. He came for you. And he came for me. And parents, he came for the child that we are unsure will ever come back to their faith. Spouses, he came for the husband or the wife who has grown bitter and hard and that we're not sure we could ever love or could ever love us again. Men, he's come for those that feel like they'll never be free of the addiction of what we're looking at on our phones or our computers. He came for those that are self-medicating with substance with alcohol, with drugs. He came for those that feel like they'll never be free of the anxiety or the depression that is literally weighing them down at this time of year. He came for us. And he came that he might pull us out of all of those things. Listen, to give us joy, to give us hope, to give us faith, to give us peace. And so here's what we're going to do. So I'm going to ask everyone just to bow their heads. And we're going to do this response in kind of just two quick modes. There's a part of me that wants to just pray for you. And so look, if you're here this morning, if you're watching online and, and you say, Joe, I don't have a lot of joy right now. I'm worried. I'm tired. I'm anxious. I'm hurt. I'm unsure, and you realize that your heart is the furthest thing away from joy that it could be. And you might say, Joe, would you just simply pray for me? I want to know the joy of Jesus in my heart. I want to know the joy that only comes because I know that he came for me. If that's you and you would like for me just to pray for you and that you would find joy in that this Christmas, would you just simply raise your hand this morning? Just raise it up and say, Joe, just pray for me. Father, I come. And Lord, my prayer this morning is for everybody that raised their hand. And God, my prayer is also for those that, that didn't but needed to. And Lord, my prayer is that in whatever moment or season or situation of life that they're in, that God, you would meet them there this week. Lord, some of them may feel dry. Some of them may feel like they haven't heard from you in forever. Some of them may feel that, that you're not there. God, some of them may feel that you don't care. Some of them may feel abandoned. But Lord, my prayer is that this week, in the next seven days, that you would meet them right where they are. 
And God, that just like there was no mistaking the fact that something had happened, that you would come from heaven to earth, that Lord, that they would not be able to mistake the fact that you've met them. God, whether it is a chorus of angels singing, whether it is a star on a distant horizon, that they would say, God is doing something. I believe it. And no matter how big or how small, I'm going to celebrate it. And God, that you would give them a spirit of joy in their hearts to know that no matter what the momentary struggle is that they're facing, that God, you came and you paid the ultimate price for them. That Lord, you have redeemed them from themselves and from their lives. And God, you have changed what they deserve. That Lord, they are your sons and your daughters. And so, Lord, may you speak that into their hearts this week, that, God, they would find a joy they haven't had in a long time. Now, my second question is this, just still with your heads bowed. I just want to ask, is there anyone here in this room? Is, maybe you're even watching this online, and you would say, Joe, I, I don't really know that I even just know Jesus as my Savior. Maybe you've been in church your whole life. Maybe you just came or you're just logging on today for the first time, but you would say, I, I don't know him as my personal Savior. I've heard about him. I've learned about him. I, I believe in him, but I've never called out and said, Jesus, I need you to save my soul. I need you to give me a new heart and a new life. I need you to do in me what I cannot do for myself. And if that's you, whether you're here or you're online, I, I want to just pray this prayer, and I want to invite you to just repeat it with me. And it's just very simply this. Lord Jesus, I need you. I am unable to change myself. I am unable to change what I deserve. I know that I, I've done things that aren't right. I know I've said things and thought things, God. I know that I am broken and imperfect, and Jesus, I desperately need you to do in me what I cannot do in myself. Jesus, would you give me a new heart? Would you give me a new life? And would you let me know that not only am I forgiven, but I am redeemed and I am loved. Jesus, change my heart and my life today. Father, I, I just come to you, and Lord, I thank you for Christmas. It is a busy and hectic time of year. But God, without the manger, we wouldn't get the cross. God, if you hadn't come as a baby, there would have been no hands to be nailed. There would have been no feet to be nailed without a, a brow. There would have been no crown of thorns to go, God, that you came to redeem us and to pay a price that, God, we couldn't possibly pay. And so, Lord, I thank you so much for the love and the humility that you show us in the Christmas season. And, Lord, my prayer is that as we go as a church, that, Lord, over this week, not only would you pour that hope and that love and that joy into our hearts, but, God, I pray that whether it's a store, a restaurant, our offices, our schools, our homes, our neighborhoods, God, may we be agents of that grace this week. May we be ambassadors for you. And Lord, may we shine bright, not because of who we are, but because of what you have done for us. Father, we love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.